All right, good morning. Uh, hello, I'm Melissa Green, a Technology Accessibility Training Specialist with the Center for Instructional Technologies Technology Accessibility Team. The Center for Instructional Technology, or CIT, is a unit of the university's Office of Information Technology. And our team, the Technology Accessibility Team, works to ensure that all technology users, including those with disabilities, have a functional and accessible technology experience with the university's websites and the technologies we use for teaching, learning, and conducting the business of the university. And you can find more information about our efforts on our website at accessibility.ua.edu. During today's session, we'll look at some of the assistive technologies people with disabilities use to access websites, documents, audio, video, and other digital content. This session will cover hardware and software that enable people with disabilities to access, interact with, and use computers, as well as accessibility features built into the Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android operating systems. Today's session is just a starting point. It won't include all of the assistive technologies that are available, uh, but by the time you leave today, I hope that you have a better understanding of accessibility from the user perspective. Uh, a quick moment for housekeeping. This slide includes a picture of me. I have my webcam turned off, but I thought you might like to see who you are speaking with today. So that's me, hello. <laughs> uh, to improve audio quality, I have muted everyone by default, but when you want to speak, just select the microphone icon in the Zoom control bar uh, to mute or unmute yourself. You can also choose to have your camera on or off. Uh, please do mute your microphone when you're not speaking. When I'm talking or sharing my screen, uh, please indicate in the chat box if you can't see or hear something. And you're welcome to use that chat box throughout. I may not be watching closely while I'm talking, uh, but I'll do my best to check in every once in a while. And if I don't see your question or comment immediately, um, I will come back to it at the end. This session is being recorded. I'll send you a link to that recording via email in the next few days, along with links to resources shared during today's session. Uh, with all that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. So what is assistive technology? The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, defines it as any item, piece of equipment, or product system, whether acquired commercially, modified, or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. In other words, assistive technology is technology used to perform functions that might otherwise be difficult or impossible. Um, along with hardware and software that assist people with disabilities with technology access, assistive technology also includes uh, mobility devices, such as walkers or wheelchairs, uh, communication systems, and devices that support activities of daily living, uh, such as bath chairs or grab bars, uh, tools to help reach and pick up objects, and so on. Assistive technology for computer access, which is our focus today, uh, typically falls under two categories, input devices and output devices. And we'll look at those now before turning to the accessibility features uh, built into popular operating systems. Conventional computer access involves using a standard keyboard and mouse or touchpad to input information. Assistive technology for input works to provide the same type of functionality that a standard keyboard and mouse provide. Beyond the more standard variety of QWERTY keyboards, there are a wide variety of alternative keyboards. Um, alternative keyboards may provide a more functional key layout, like this Dvorak keyboard that places the most commonly used letters in the home row so your fingers move less or the split keyboard that enables you to place the two keyboard halves in a way that better supports natural hand positioning. Alternative keyboards may be designed for one-handed use. On this slide is a picture of a half 
QWERTY keyboard that allows you to type with one hand. Uh, the way it works is that you place your hand on the keyboard in the standard position with the letters under your hand exactly the same as on a standard keyboard. But when you hold down the space bar, the characters produced by striking the keys under your hand change to those typically found on the other half of the keyboard. Alternative keyboards may be color coded to show correct finger placement. Uh, this can be especially useful to users with cognitive disabilities as well as those learning to type. Uh, some variations assign different colors to consonants and vowels to help users understand their different roles in reading and language. A large key keyboard is another type of alternative keyboard. Uh, bigger keys make it easier to locate and operate the keys. Large print keyboards help make keys easier to see for older adults, uh, users with low vision, or others who wish to reduce eye strain. This slide depicts an Easy C brand keyboard. It has large, bold, black letters on white keys. In addition to the standard white on black, uh, they're also available in high contrast colors, including black on yellow. Um, we have one of these in our office. If you'd ever like to see one in person, our particular color combination is uh, black lettering on bright yellow keys. A variety of accessories have been designed to make keyboards more accessible to people with disabilities. Uh, like key guards, um, or excuse me, key guards can make it easier for users to strike the right key or avoid striking the wrong one. Um, these may be used by people with unsteady fingers or those using pointing devices with the keyboard, which we'll talk about momentarily. Another kind of keyboard addition is a moisture guard, a thin sheet of plastic that protects keyboards from spills, saliva, and other moisture. Alternative labels add visual clarity or tactile information to the keys, like large print or braille, so those could be used to modify a standard keyboard. We've been looking at alternative keyboards and keyboard additions, which are physical uh, or hardware. Another alternative is the on-screen keyboard. On-screen keyboards are software-generated images of a standard or modified keyboard um, that are placed on a computer screen or display screen. The keys are selected by a mouse, a touchscreen, trackball, joystick, switch, or electronic pointing device. Uh, there's lots of possible features with an electronic keyboard, um, like the ability to change the appearance of it to a color combination that's easier to see. You can load different character sets and layouts. Um, they often come with features like word prediction, abbreviation, or expansion to help speed up text input and help with spelling. Uh, this slide includes a screenshot of the Windows 10 on-screen keyboard. Earlier, I said that conventional computer access involves using a standard keyboard and a mouse or touchpad to input information. Let's quickly look at some alternatives to the standard mouse. These may be especially beneficial for users who have difficulty controlling fine motor movements or who lack upper body control. For people who have shaky or unintentional arm movements, uh, joysticks are a good replacement for a traditional mouse because they provide greater control of the direction and speed of the cursor on the screen. Uh, joysticks can also be used in whatever position the user finds most comfortable while operating the computer, which could be sitting up at a desk or in a chair, but also could be uh, while reclining or lying down. A trackball mouse is often easier for a person with a motor disability to operate than a standard mouse. Trackballs are sometimes recommended to those experiencing pain from repetitive strain injury associated with standard mouse use or those wishing to avoid um, incurring a repetitive strain injury. 
Continuing our look at assistive technology for computer input, uh, pointing devices are another option for individuals who need an alternative to the mouse and keyboard to input information into the computer because of limited or lack of movement in their hands and arms. Lots of different kinds of pointers are available. On the low end of the tech spectrum, there's wood or plastic sticks that are worn on the head, held in the mouth, strapped to the chin, or held in the hand. And that's what's depicted on this slide. Um, there's a photograph of an individual using a pointing device, um, in this case, a mouth stick, to interact with their computer. Higher tech options for pointing enable a user to control their device through head or eye movements. The Tracker Pro, for example, takes the place of a mouse for a person with little or no hand movement. When the device is combined with a small dot that is attached to a person's forehead, or their glasses or the rim of a hat, um, users are able to access their computer in the same way a conventional mouse provides access. We're gonna take a look at a quick video demo of um, this type of electronic tracker, in this case, the Tracker Pro. Hello, today we're going to talk about Tracker Pro a plug-and-play head mouse that enables the user to control a mouse by moving their head and is compatible with Mac OS X, Windows, Chrome, and Android operating systems. To set up Tracker Pro, place Dualog on the stand and Tracker Pro tab, and connect Tracker Pro to the stand. Place the stand on the monitor or table surface and plug Tracker Pro into an available USB port on the computer. Once plugged in, you'll see the white power LED is lit, which indicates it is on. Place a Tracker Pro reflective dot on your forehead or on glasses and wait for Tracker Pro to detect the tracking dot. The blue LED light indicates that Tracker Pro has recognized the tracker dot. For left and right mouse clicks, you can use two external switches with Tracker Pro, or you can use an automatic mouse clicking software like Dwell Clicker 2. To use switches with Tracker Pro, simply plug a switch adapter cable into the switch port on Tracker Pro. The white jack indicates a left click and the red jack indicates a right click. For some users, you may need to adjust the sensitivity of Tracker Pro. On the back of Tracker Pro, you will find a small toggle switch that is used to make this adjustment. To learn more about Tracker Pro from AbleNet or our entire line of products, visit us at www.abelnetinc.com. So Tracker Pro is a commercial product, obviously, as we got that little plug there at the end. Um, if you want to experience using a technology similar to this um, for free, there is a program called Camera Mouse that you can download. I know it's available for PC. I'm not sure about Mac, but it allows you to designate a feature on your face as um, what should be tracked. So rather than the sticky dot, as we saw with the Tracker Pro, you could choose, let's say, the tip of your nose or your chin um, to be tracked and navigate the computer that way. That's an, an interesting sort of thing to do to, to get an idea of what it's like for users of electronic pointing devices to access and interact with your digital content. Another electronic pointing device, the Toby Dynavox, enables a user to control their device through their eye movements. Let's take a look at how this one works. Eye tracking is a technology that is used to see where a person is looking on a computer screen. The technology can also be used to control a computer. Instead of using a traditional keyboard and mouse, you control it by using your eyes. Illuminators in the eye tracker send out near-infrared light that is reflected by your eyes. A camera registers these reflections and through filtering and advanced calculations, we can determine where on the screen you are looking and then place the computer cursor consistently and accurately. There are certain things that set Toby Dynavox eye trackers apart from others. Besides an unprecedented pattern portfolio and many technical details, one is the fact that we use a unique and very accurate 3D model of a human eye. With this model, you don't need to keep your head still when using a Toby eye tracker. 
In fact, you can move your head freely without any significant loss of precision or accuracy. This is particularly beneficial for individuals with uncontrolled head movement, such as those with cerebral palsy. For accurate eye tracking, the eye tracker needs to find your pupils. This can be done through either bright or dark pupil tracking. Bright pupil tracking works similarly to when you get red eyes using a compact camera with a flash. By placing the flash, or in this case the illuminators, farther away from the lens, you can avoid this. This is dark pupil tracking. Toby Dynavox eye trackers are unique in that they dynamically switch between bright and dark pupil tracking, so you'll always have an optimized eye tracking experience. There are many other things that make Toby Dynavox eye trackers unique. To learn more, please visit tobydynavox.com. So one of the things that um, you'll often hear people say about assistive or accessible technology is that it's necessary for some, in this case, individuals with disabilities, um, but beneficial for all. And uh, this eye tracker is a great example of this. This same company, Toby Dynavox, manufactures hardware and software that's used for website usability testing. So it does eye tracking um, in order to help web designers see how individuals uh, interact with a website. And their products um, also have quite a following among some uh, computer gamers. Um, apparently using eye tracking can sometimes be a lot faster than um, using the keyboard or a joystick when playing some computer games. So a great example of how something developed to provide increased access for individuals with disabilities has come to be used um, for other needs as well. Switches also offer an alternative method of providing input to a device when it's not possible to use a standard keyboard or mouse. Um, if a user can control one body part, they can operate a switch. And switches come in various sizes, shapes, methods of activation, and placement options as depicted on this slide. In this video, uh, a user of a switch, Sadie, uses two pressure switches mounted on the headrest of her wheelchair. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not the way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. <laughs> or edit a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. So we see Sadie using her head to activate the two pressure switches mounted on the headrest of her wheelchair, uh, but pressure switches can also be activated with the hand, elbow, or another body part. This video demonstrates the use of a sip and puff switch. Uh, sip and puff users send signals to a device using air pressure by sipping or inhaling or puffing or exhaling 
on a straw tube or wand. And in this video, uh, a vendor demonstrating the use of a sip and puff switch uh, uses that switch to control a CD player. Hi, Vinny Labordi here at Tech Supported Enabling. I'm skip devices. ahead just a Today little like bit. So Puff started the CD, another Puff will pause it. Start it again. Now I'm going to sip on it to advance the track. It's very simple, it's very easy to use it, hardly use any effort to do that. Sip and puffs are primarily used by people who do not have the use of their hands, such as quadriplegics with very high spinal cord injuries or people with ALS. When switches are used for computer access, they're typically used in conjunction with scanning. Uh, the scanning indicator moves through items by highlighting each item on the screen. Uh, this is called visual scanning or by announcing each item via voice output. Uh, this is called auditory scanning. And when a visual or auditory prompt indicates a specific keyboard or mouse function, the user activates the switch and the desired function occurs. A switch control is the iOS accessibility feature that lets you control your iPhone, iPad, or iPod touch using a single switch or multiple switches. We're going to take a look at switch control, the iOS accessibility feature, being used with a pressure switch, the Blue 2 by AbleNet. This is our single switch auto scanning setup. Um, with Blue 2 and iOS 7 switch control. Um, first thing we're going to do is triple click our home button to turn switch control on. So one, two, three. And you're going to see the scan show up on the screen. So we did set it to uh, pause for three seconds on the first item as you saw there. And it's just going to auto scan through all the options on the home screen. We've set up Blue 2 so the white and the orange switch are to select an item. So let's just go ahead and select down here. So once again, it's going to pause for three seconds on the first item and then start to scan. So I'm going to go into the browser. Um, we did turn auto tap off, so it's going to bring up this menu here to select an item. Um, you're going to select the first option, tap. And this is going to take you into the application. So as you can see here, I was on Amazon last night and um, it's going to start scanning through the web browser. So if I want to exit, I'm just going to tap either the white or orange switch. It's going to bring up that menu again. And I'm going to wait for it to start scanning here and go to home. So that is the single switch auto scanning setup. We also have one of these in the technology accessibility team office. Um, if you'd like to swing by and give it a try using it to access um, an iPad with switch control. Another alternative to the standard keyboard or mouse is voice recognition or speech recognition software that converts spoken words to computer text, uh, allowing the user to speak to the computer instead of using a keyboard or mouse to input text or control computer functions. Dragon is probably the most well-known speech recognition software. Uh, let's take a brief look as the speaker uses it with Word on a Mac to write, format, and edit text. Dragon for Mac version 5 includes support for both Microsoft Word 2011 and Microsoft Word 2016, period. You can mix talking and typing while you use Dragon's voice commands to format comma, edit comma, and correct text, period. New paragraph.
the user types. Now I am typing on the keyboard. And now I'm back to using Dragon, period. Bold talking and typing. Capitalize voice commands. Italicize keyboard. Underline back. If you use something like Siri, Google Assistant, uh, Google Home, Alexa, um, if you have a modern smartphone, you have the power of speech recognition in your pocket. Uh, speech or voice recognition tools can enhance productivity and efficiency for users of all abilities, but are especially beneficial for people with physical dif disabilities who have difficulty accessing the keyboard and individuals whose oral language abilities are stronger than their written language abilities. We've looked at several examples of assistive technology that work through the keyboard or emulate the functionality of the keyboard. Uh, that is why ensuring that the digital content you create is operable by both keyboard and mouse is so important. Web Accessibility Perspectives Keyboard compatibility. Not being able to use your computer because your mouse doesn't work is frustrating. Many people use only the keyboard to navigate websites, either through preference or circumstance. Whether it's temporarily limited mobility, a permanent physical disability, or simply a broken mouse, the result is the same. Websites and apps need to be operable by keyboard. Web accessibility, essential for some, useful for all. Visit w3.org slash WAI slash perspectives for more information on keyboard compatibility. So if you, as the digital content creator or web developer or web application developer, will ensure that all functionality of your digital content is usable with the keyboard, uh, generally the input devices and software we've looked at will take care of the rest. We're going to move on to assistive technology for output. Uh, conventional computer access involves a monitor or screen for information output. And assistive technology for output works to provide the same type of functionality that a monitor or screen does. A braille display is an example of an assistive technology used for computer output. Uh, you're probably familiar with braille, the raised dot printed language used by many people with visual disabilities. With braille, each raised dot arrangement represents a letter or word combination. Electronic braille displays provide access to information on a computer screen by raising and lowering different combinations of pins to form the arrangements of raised dots. So rather than static printed braille, uh, electronic braille displays are dynamic with the pins raising and lowering um, as the content on the screen changes. Screen Reader is a software program that converts digital text into synthesized speech, enabling users to hear content and navigate with the keyboard. Screen readers are used by people who are blind or have low vision. They're also used by people with certain cognitive or learning disabilities or users who simply prefer audio content over text or in addition to text. Screen readers read content differently from humans. They present the content to users uh, linearly, one item at a time. And this contrasts with the way that most sighted users access digital content. Sighted users can scan an entire screen almost instantaneously, um, taking in the overall layout and visually identifying content of interest or importance. Uh, screen reader users must progress through that content from beginning to end. It's kind of like having to listen to an automated phone menu in which all of the choices are presented one by one before you can make your selection. That being said, uh, screen reader software or screen readers do provide ways for users to navigate content more quickly and efficiently. Um, one way is to use the tab key 
to jump from link to link. This gives the user an idea of where the page links to and can be a useful way to run through the content if the user is looking for a specific link. A related technique is to use a keyboard shortcut to obtain a list of the links on the page arranged alphabetically. And this is why your link text should be descriptive so that links make sense out of context. If your link text is generic and reads something like click here or more or read more, it's not going to make sense to someone um, navigating by tabbing from link to link or pulling up a list of links on the page. It needs to be more descriptive so that those links make sense out of context. Another way screen reader users may interact with your website or electronic documents is to jump from heading to heading. When your content uses headings, users can hear an outline of the page's main ideas and go directly to the parts they're most interested in. And that's why it's so important to include those headings and to make sure they present an accurate outline of the content. Screen reader users can also jump from one page landmark element or section to another, uh, but in order for them to do any of these things and navigate effectively, you, the content creator or web or application developer, have to provide that semantic structure. Screen magnification software magnifies text and images on the screen, increasing visibility for users with limited vision. Uh, most programs have variable magnification levels and some offer text-to-speech options. Magnification software is built into the major operating systems. Third-party software is also available. Uh, the difference between the two, what comes with the operating system and what is typically found with third-party software, is that the third-party software usually provides more features and functionality, like the ability to zoom to higher magnification levels or uh, more color combinations to choose from. Our university licenses the Zoom Text Screen Magnification and Reading Program for use on university-owned computers. Um, if you, as a UA user or someone who manages a computer lab um, or multiple computers at UA, think this might be useful for yourself or um, for the users with whom you work, there's information about that on the OIT website in the software catalog. The program, again, is called Zoom Text. This video clip is a little longer than the others we've looked at, but I think it's a worthwhile watch because it demonstrates uh, braille displays, screen reading, and the screen magnification software we just talked about, while also talking about how accessibility impacts a diverse user experience. Hi, my name is Victor Tsaran and I work as a technology program manager at Google. At Google, I work on making sure that the products we create are accessible to the audience of our diverse users, regardless of their ability or impairment. Modern uh, web technologies make it very easy for a developer to create a website that's difficult for someone who is blind to use. If a user has no vision, it's quite likely they would be using a screen reader, which is a software that allows them to hear the information displayed on the screen via a text-to-speech synthesizer. They may also be using Braille, which allows them to feel the on-screen text with their fingers when using Braille display. Many websites are visual in their nature and lack keyboard navigation, which is essential for blind people to be able to navigate through the content. In general, it is safe to assume that there are more people with visual impairments, uh, that is, people who have some sight as opposed to people who are completely blind. There are also people with low visual acuity and they may be using large print text or magnification when using the computer. For example, my friend Laura uses magnification with text-to-speech as well as various color contrast options. Let's meet up at the coffee shop. I can order something for you. Iced coffee, okay? Oh, and I haven't mentioned people with poor color vision who have may have difficulty distinguishing red and green or blue and yellow. This accounts for 9% of male and 1% of female. We may also find ourselves with temporary challenges 
such as when trying to use a computer in the sun or looking at a dodgy projector. Whenever accessibility comes up in a conversation, people tend to picture someone who is blind, like myself. But there are actually more impairments to think about and consider. There is a huge number of people with a motor or dexterity impairments. Such users may be using only the keyboard, head or eye tracking software, switches, voice dictation, etc. Someone may have a broken wrist, broken trackpad, or simply riding a shaky train. By catering to users with permanent dexterity impairments, we ensure a great experience for everyone. There are also users with hearing impairments. For example, some may be completely deaf, yet others have some hearing. The content that uses sound should provide some kind of visual alternative. For example, a messenger app could be using a flashing alert as well as sound notifications. There are also users with cognitive impairments. For example, ADD, dyslexia or autism. These users may require diverse accommodations such as zooming the screen to make it easier to read the content or minimal design to minimize distraction and cognitive load. We can all probably relate to feeling stressful or cognitive load. So improving experience for users with cognitive impairments makes it so much better experience for everybody else. In summary, accessibility is really about making sure that the content and the websites we create is usable to people with various impairments or abilities. While not exactly used for computer input and output, another important kind of assistive technology used in conjunction with the computer is software that supports reading, writing, and learning. Uh, this is where I plug the text help tools that are freely available to all UA students, faculty, and staff. Uh, these include Mac and PC desktop software, Google Chrome apps and extensions, and iOS and Android apps that support reading, writing, language learning, and STEM subjects. The tools are Read and Write, Equatio, and Snapverter. Uh, Read and Write supports reading, writing, research, and studying. It offers a simple toolbar at the top of the screen that offers support with tasks like reading text out loud, so using text to speech, um, understanding unfamiliar words through features like a dictionary and a visual dictionary, uh, researching assignments, and proofing written work. Equatio is an application that you can use to type, handwrite, or speak to create equations, formulas, and other math and chemistry expressions. It also um, has a feature where you can take a picture of uh, math whether it's on a whiteboard or in a handout or in a textbook and convert it to digital math. And Snapverter is an easy to use add-on for read and write for Google Chrome and an iOS app that transforms papers and files into readable PDF documents. These tools, the text help tools, and others like them are particularly beneficial for users with learning disabilities and English language learners, but they're useful for everyone. Um, if you'd like to learn more about them, information about those is available via the OIT software catalog under the entry text help. I wanted to spend most of our time today exploring assistive technologies you might not be exposed to or able to access otherwise. Uh, this final category of assistive technology is something that everyone has access to um, and you'll be able to explore on your own, but I want to give you a brief introduction. Accessibility features are various options that exist within products that allow a user to adjust the settings to meet their personal visual, mobility, hearing, language, and learning needs. Most of the settings you need to make a Windows PC easier to use can be found under ease of access. 
Uh, to access them, you can go to the Windows 10 Settings menu, then select Ease of Access, um, or go to the Control Panel and select the Ease of Access Center. This slide includes a screenshot of the Ease of Access Center. Uh, here, settings are grouped together in categories. Um, like use the computer without a display or use the computer without a mouse or keyboard. Um, the groupings are there so people can figure out which accessibility features they need. Ease of access options can help make it easier to use a PC without a display. Uh, for example, Narrator is a screen reader built into Windows that reads elements on the screen like text and buttons. There's settings that can make it easier to see what's on the screen. Uh, for example, you can use Magnifier, a Windows built-in screen magnification feature, to make the content on the screen bigger um, or switch to a high contrast theme. There's several options for making the keyboard easier to use. You can turn on an on-screen keyboard, like the ones we talked about when we were looking at assistive technology for computer input. Uh, one of my favorite Windows accessibility features is called Sticky Keys. Uh, when it's turned on, you can press one key at a time for keyboard shortcuts, which is helpful for people with limited dexterity or mobility in their hands and fingers. So for example, Control-Alt-Delete. Typically, one has to strike those keys in sequence and hold them down um, all at the same time. You can adjust the setting such that um, you could take longer to strike the keys or you didn't have to hold them all down at, at the same time in order to get the same result. So it's a really cool feature, um, particularly for people with limited dexterity or mobility in their hands, um, someone who is experiencing arthritis and so on. And there's also options for the mouse, like the ability to change the pointer size um, or turn on mouse keys to use your keypad to move the mouse. Like Windows, the Mac operating system has a number of accessibility features that are built right in. Uh, you can find them by opening the Apple menu in the upper left, then choosing System Preferences, then Accessibility. Um, the accessibility preferences are also available via keyboard shortcuts, or you can ask Siri to turn on some of them. Um, there's so much here to explore, but there's some highlights that correlate with what I mentioned on the Windows side. Uh, VoiceOver is the Mac OS built-in screen reader. Zoom is the screen magnifier. There's the ability to make items on the screen easier to see, such as changing the pointer size and contrast options and lots of keyboard and other options. The iOS operating system for iPhones and iPads offers many of the same accessibility features as the Mac, as well as some that are unique to that platform. Um, since a lot of developers with disabilities use iPhones, and since iPads have been widely adopted in education, there's a big selection of accessibility and learning support apps for iOS. I don't want to give Android short shrift. Um, I'm an Android fan myself, but there's not a lot there that we haven't already looked at on the other platforms just to kind of make comparisons. Talkback is the screen reader. Switch access is the Android equivalent of iOS switch control. Uh, voice access lets you control your device with spoken commands. So you can do things like open apps, navigate and edit text hands free. Um, there's a feature called Braille Back that allows you to connect a refreshable Braille display to your device via Bluetooth. And then Android devices like iOS devices and uh, the PC and Mac operating systems um, have several settings to make the screen easier to see. You can change the size of items on the screen, adjust the display or font size. Um, you can zoom with magnification gestures and adjust contrast or colors, use high contrast text, invert colors, or do things like correct colors to make them easier to see. So um, lots of different options there to explore. In closing, um, it's my hope that today's session has provided you with a better understanding of the hardware and software that enable people with disabilities to access, interact with, and use computers, 
and that you'll apply that understanding in designing digital content that everyone can access and use. Um, we're here to help with that. You can visit us at accessibility.ua.edu or contact accessibility at ua.edu if we can be of assistance. Um, momentarily, I'll stop the recording um, in order to take any questions or um, share thoughts, but I'd like to um, thank you all for your time this morning before I do that. So thanks, thanks for joining me this morning. And um, I'm happy to, to take questions or, or discuss your thoughts. <laughs>